Thank you for joining us today for this presentation and discussion of the story of Ray Mambo with Marvin Ray Valmel and Kathy and Carl Burge of Close Up Productions. This lecture and the others in the Art Deco at Play series is presented by the Miami Design Preservation League and the Wolfsonian FIU Museum with support of the City of Miami Beach and the Miami-Dade County. Carl and Kathy Hirsch are award-winning filmmakers who lived in Miami long enough to feel like natives. Between them, they have worked in 36 countries telling stories and documenting history-making events for clients as diverse as the British Broadcasting Corporation and Starbucks. They have interviewed over 60 people for the Miami Visual Memoir Project, establishing an archive which will soon be available for public use through the Florida International University Digital Library. The story of Ray Mambo, which you're about to see, is the first of three educational films they are producing which are based on interviews with people who witnessed Miami Beach history. Marvin Baumel, AKA Ray Mambo, came to Miami Beach with his parents when he was 13 years old. He fell in love with all things Latin and learned to speak and sing in Spanish and play the bongos rather well. Eventually, he became a successful Latin band leader during the Latin music craze in the late 40s and 50s. Ray, as he prefers to be called, later became a film actor, appearing with Frank Sinatra in Tony Rome. Ray also appeared with Sinatra in Lady in Cement. He rewrote the script changing his character from an Irish bartender to a Cuban bowling alley owner. <laughs> Ray also appears in a work in progress about the Latin music craze in the 1950s called Mambo Deeks. I want to take an op the opportunity to thank the Kirches, who have become fast and furious friends in doing this, plus the uh, visual memoirs that they've been doing on Miami Beach interviewing what is it, up to 60 people? And uh, for that, that's how we first met. Ah, oh, it's, uh, it, it's like a dream. I wanted to um, just mention in passing that um, oh, when I first came in 1938, we didn't have these. <laughs> that this is a delight for me because this is the second time to be in this building uh, involved in the arts. And I've got to share this with you, because um, I had um, a painting that I did that was in this building, in the window, facing Washington Avenue. And I was delighted when I heard that it was sold. Of course, it was not the Wilsonian in those days. It was Washington Storage, where the rich people used to store all their uh, cars and minks and stuff when they used to uh, leave for the summer. And I was going to be an artist. I was all set to be an artist. I mean, I you know, change professions every decade. So um, I did this drawing, and it was in the window. And then it was not in the window. So I went in, and I said, where's my painting? He says, we just sold it. And he gives me $25. Uh, this was over 70 years ago. I was 15 years old. And you can imagine what, okay, 15, do the math. 1940, approximately, very close to that. So I was still in high school. And 25 bucks, you know. And in those days, the first thing I did was went home and give it to my folks. I mean, that was, that was the ethos of those days. Uh, uh, delighted to be able to contribute something to the household on that. So I thought I'd share that with you. And not only that, when I, I went to junior high here uh, on Drexel, it was Ida Fisher, and then to Miami Beach Senior High, the old school. But when I got out of, uh, uh, finished the day in high school, I never went home. I went to my dad's store, which was a half a block from here, between 10th and 9th on Washington Avenue. Now, it wasn't his store, because he couldn't afford the rental in those days. And we came here in 38, as it was mentioned. He had $200 in his pocket, the life-saving, and came here for my mom's health. 
And uh, he had a handbag concession in a jewelry shop right between 9th and 10th. So that's the first place I went. And I was drawing all the time. Well, I drew caricatures. That's what I love, cartoons and caricatures. And I really wanted to eventually go to Fleischer Studios. Now, Leon Fleischer and Fleischer Studios was here, was an animation setup. Popeye to Salem. Anybody old enough to remember those cartoons here? Huh? Popeye? Yeah, you, know, you don't have to be afraid, raise your hands. You know? um, and Gulliver's Travels. I think, I'm not sure of this, they, that might have been the first full length feature. I think it might have been before Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. But uh, I'll have to Google that one. So I did caricatures. And I, I just went all over the place trying to sell these caricatures. And there was a Bill's Waffle Shop between 9th and 8th on Washington Avenue. And he saw them and he loved them. And I said, well, why don't you buy a couple? He says, I'll buy all of them. Here's the kid who was a multimillionaire already with 25 bucks. For <laughs> And I sold all my caricatures, and in Bill's Waffle Shop, I used to go in just to see them all along the wall. And that was such a kick for me uh, on that. So I started running all over trying to sell my caricatures, and I went up to a nightclub, which was about the 20s, which was the end of the... <laughs> Roni Plaza was the end of, the, of Miami Beach, <laughs> hard to believe, practically. and. Um, it was a nightclub and I walked in and obviously these guys were from Chicago and um, uh, they said, you know, we can't use that look. We got these, uh, these women painted on the walls here and it was semi-nudes. So I said, well, what you do, you take the caricatures and you cover the faces, you know, of the semi-nudes. The guy loved it. He bought <laughs> Already I was an entrepreneur, right? <laughs> and he said, that's funny. What do you think, Tony? That's funny. Okay, they bought the caricatures and they put them up over. <laughs> to see those caricatures are like the Marx Brothers, semi-nude. What can I tell you? So, uh, <laughs> and then um, I'll just wind it up with, there was a nightclub. These guys owned another nightclub called the Paddock Club. That was approximately 5th or 6th Washington, right on the corner. And they had an entertainer there known as Pete Clifford. And uh, he had a, a, a mini piano. They wanted me to do his caricature, which I did right on his piano. A big caricature of uh, him. He was pretty well known then. Well, come to find out that uh, not too much later, he was murdered. Uh, I don't know if it's ever been solved. And it was two blocks away from where we lived in our apartment. So uh, a little bit of the, uh, of the past uh, history of, uh, of what I was all about. And, and uh, who knew at that age that I would end up, uh, although I loved Latin music, that I would end up uh, uh, with a Latin band. Um, I, I tell you, uh, I've been blessed with a lifetime of working of working joy, I call it, and two decades making the music I love, and four decades making people laugh. So I'm getting paid for that. I mean, uh, what could be better? Uh, I'm thankful. I'm thankful to my parents who never pushed me to be a doctor or lawyer. No, nothing wrong with doctors and lawyers, folks. You know? But they said, you do what you want to do. And my brother was a concert violinist. Uh, he was the fiddler on the roof, by the way, not on the roof, but in the pit on Broadway. And my folks were, were just marvelous in letting me do what I wanted to do. So that was really, um, I wanted to have a Latin band, and that's how it developed. But enough about me. Let's talk about Ray Mambo. <laughs> any Q&A, any questions, uh, anything that I could be helpful with, I'd be more than happy to share. Oh, come on, come on, come on. Yeah, way in the back. Way in the back. Hi, yeah, and I'm, I apologize if I missed this in the movie because I came in a little late. But um, you mentioned, okay, so how long did you have your band? About 20 years? The band, uh, yeah, actually, what it was was the band evolved 
from strictly Latin music that I played. But uh, after the, uh, when hotels were permitted to have nightclubs in the hotels, which Danny Davis of, uh, uh, of a nightclub said would be the end of music and nightclubs, and he was right. Um, we had to play uh, not only Latin music, but all kinds of music, and cut a show. So eventually, I had to have musicians who could read music. Honestly, the first band I had, nobody could read music, including me. <laughs> so um, uh, that was it. What was your question? I get Oh, well, that's another documentary. <laughs> uh, sure. Uh, I did stand-up comedy. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, I was behind the drums. I was doing shtick, as we say in the business. And uh, I, just, I just loved humor. I loved to do things. And uh, this is another documentary, really, but... I really broke up my band. I opened the Seville Hotel. I was there three years. I worked a lot of the hotels. Opened the Carillon, the Aztec, uh, the Thunderbird uh, with my bands. And then um, got an offer, really, to do uh, some stand-up. And I actually was working at the Seville Hotel in the third year that I was there. Those are the years where you used to work all week as a musician and have Monday nights off, which doesn't exist anymore, unfortunately. And uh, <clears throat> I just decided that I wanted to do stand-up. I did a little shtick at the Footlighters here, and uh, the rest was history. I said, um, you know, fortunately, I had a wife who, who understood where I was at. I mean, here I am with a steady gig, a band, two kids, young kids, and I wanted to do stand-up. And my wife said, I, I don't want to live with a guy who thinks coulda, shoulda, woulda, you know, kind of thing. Get it out of your system or whatever. It, it was very tough in the beginning, and then eventually I worked the play, Playboy clubs uh, doing stand-up, and then after that about almost 40 years doing corporate humor. But that's another documentary. That's a long answer to your to your question, but thank you. Yes? Uh, I was just curious, did, did you meet Frank Sinatra here? I know he used to perform maybe at the Fountain Bowl or whatever. Did you meet him here? Is that how you got into his films? No, oh, I got into, that's another documentary. <laughs> I got into his film, the first film I did was Tony Rome. And that's available, you'll see, you'll see me as a sleazy, motel operator in, in the so-called Keys, which was actually on, the, on Biscayne Boulevard. And it was great because we were like nose to nose in this shot. Um, Sinatra and me, and he was looking for somebody, you know, whatever. If you see the film Tony Rome, you'll see it. <clears throat> and come to find out that Sinatra was uh, impressed with that. I had learned from the uh, agent who booked it. And then subsequently, they were shooting down here too, because Sinatra was working in the Fountain Blue Hotel and all that. And they did uh, Lady in Cement. And uh, Lady in Cement, um, there's a whole other story with that, but I ended up converting the original script which was for an Irish bartender. And I told the director, whom I had known from the previous film, um, what do you mean Irish? You know, this is Miami, you should be Cuban. I said, well, read the script as if it were a Cuban. So I read the script. Uh, Why he put here this uh, play on the wall, I know like this, you know. <laughs> Wait a minute, he says, I gotta call, I gotta call the, the executive director of this whole thing. And he calls the guy out, they're cracking up. And he says, we gotta rewrite the script. Um, he said, let me call the, 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 uh, the writer up. And the writer wrote down everything I said, translating it in a Cuban idiom. And if you watch the film, Lady in Cement, 
you'll see me instead of being an Irish, uh, I think it was an Irish bowling alley guy, I was a Cuban, uh, I think it was an Irish bartender, it ended up as a Cuban. And the guy says, yeah, we'll use the name, uh, and he had an American, I said, no, you can't use that name, it's gotta be a Cuban name. He says, well, give me a name. I said, uh, Gonzalez. He said, well, what? I said, Paco, Paco Gonzalez. Paco Gonzalez was born. So when you see the film, you'll see Paco Gonzalez talking about the guy that come here and I said, you know, blah, blah, and all that. So Sinatra flipped over it, I learned later, and the uh, director and all that. And that was very, really very gratifying uh, in that case. So I did Flipper, I did, uh, there was a lot of filming in those days and a lot of commercials. So I was very fortunate to be here at that time. Never dreaming that I could do that, I was a band leader. And then I learned, hey, they're looking for somebody like you, why don't you go down and, uh, you know, uh, audition. So I went down, the first commercial I got, the first one I went on, Roy Tan Cigars, like that. And I said, wow, this is great. Of course, the next 15 I never got, but, uh, you know. Anyway, long answers to short questions. So, uh, Yes, in the back. If there's anything you could change from what you've done for the past, would you? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. If you could go back and change anything, what would you change? In the past. In the past? Yes. You know, I've thought about this a lot, and I'm really very fortunate. Very fortunate. I was... Um, I was married for over 50 years to a wonderful woman who also was in show business. We met, she was in the USO, I was in the Army. I don't think you can go back and change anything. I was very fortunate to have been in the Army. I was in the Army uh, in, a, in a Puerto Rican show, for crying out loud, you know, how does this happen? I'm in the Army feeling sorry for myself after having done basic and all that, and then ended up doing a war department show, the Kaki Caballeros, and, uh, and playing bongos, you know, what you do in a war daddy, like I said, I played bongos in a Puerto Rican you know, wow. I don't regret anything. I think things happen, you can make things happen to a certain extent, and if you don't love what you're doing, get out. <laughs> get out, and my life has taken turns in, in uh, so many ways that fortunately I had parents who were contributing and understanding and musical, and I had a wife who uh, had been in show business in USO, who was understanding, and uh, it, was, uh, it was great. I was very, very lucky, very lucky. Changed nothing, yep. Uh, corporations are funny, or you made them funny. <laughs> Corporate humor. Corporate humor. That's another documentary. Um, I gravitated to doing uh, stand-up. I worked at Playboy Clubs, because that's what I wanted to do, was stand-up. And that was tough, very tough, especially with two little kids and being away uh, from home at stretches. But I worked at Playboy Clubs, and. It was experience. But I have an opportunity by an agent who, uh, uh, Dick Shack, whose wife Ruth Shack, uh, many of you uh, know who that is. And, um, and he said, I got a convention coming up. And uh, uh, he says, the, the shit that you're doing with the Cuban accent, nobody was doing anything like that. He says, uh, write a little thing, don't do more than 15 minutes. I couldn't even get 12 minutes together. But I came up as the uh, uh, Dr. Marcelino Gonzalez from the uh, Cuban Insurance Agency, CIA. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and it starts out uh, uh, and uh, with a thick accent, the people are like, oh God, we're gonna have to listen to this guy. From the and never deprecating the Latins because I'm really a Latin under this Jewish skin that I'm wearing. And um, little by little, I wrote all my stuff and geared it to the profession. 
which developed into a profession of almost 40 years and an article on the front page of the Wall Street Journal, Journal which changed my life. So coming in and doing things, uh, humor in corporations was really the mainstay of my, it was still show business, but it was secret service sort of in a sense, because here they expect somebody who is a, a, a notary and an important a man and, and all that. And little by little, the humor comes out. And I did a number on the top executives, uh, the CEO. Nobody was fair game, you know. I mean, everybody was fair game. Nobody was, uh, and of course, the uh, everybody loved it. Pete. Or Cuban Pete. Cuban Pete. Cuban Pete, yes. Yeah, but I think that was in New York. I, uh, in the 50s, <clears throat> when I had the band, when I was Ray Mambo, um, the Latin craze here was unbelievable because the people from, mainly from New York, uh, came down and they came down, you know, to, for the sun and, and the uh, winters, but they, they had to have their Latin music and uh, Chinese food. So every hotel here in those days had a Latin band. Anywhere from a trio to Sacasas, who had, uh, I think, a 14-piece orchestra, also playing Latin music, but also playing shows like Patti Page, Sinatra, you know, and all those. Uh, it was hard to believe there was any American bands in those days. It was the relief, what they called the relief band, that after the big band played, which was the Latin band, the little trio would come on playing American music. It's hard to believe, that's the way it was. It was a craze here in the 50s, playing mambo, cha-cha-cha, not cha-chas, cha-cha-cha. Yes? Uh, Ray, going back to the Army, I can't imagine how they identify your talent, you know, <laughs> your musical talent. It wasn't basic training. I was, I was, uh, we had moved from uh, Camp Cyber to Camp Lee, and I was feeling sorry myself all of 20, 19. I don't think I was 20 yet. And this is like a dream. I was so miserable. And when I think of it, what did you have to be miserable about? You know, you didn't go overseas. You didn't get shot at. But you know, the, at that age, what can I tell you? And I'm walking down, the, and I hear this music coming from one of the barracks. And it's Latin music, and I knew that it wasn't uh, recorded. And I go into the barracks, and there's a Latin band rehearsing. I get goosebumps when I think about it. And I walk up, and there's a lieutenant who's the leader of the band, and this is one of three War Department shows rehearsing there to go tour the United States hospitals to play for wounded uh, uh, soldiers. And uh, speaking Spanish fluently, I, I start talking to him and I said, Yo tocaba bongo in Miami, and yo sé todo de la música latina, blah, blah, blah. And I said, You know, take me with you. you know, <laughs> take me with you. I got to get out of here. Well, he said, you know, it would be good. He said, yo, yo canto en español, I sing in Spanish and all that. And he said, it's probably too late for the orders, you know what the, how the army is and, and uh, to get it. Well, they got me on the orders and, I, and we left. We were in what today would be called a school bus traveling the United States. And the first thing the driver did, who was the trumpet player, was as soon as we got out of the post, he stopped the, the bus, went into the engine, and ripped out the governor. The governor is what doesn't let you go more than 25 miles of it, whatever it's set for. And from then on, it was history. So they were bouncing around, Roomba shirts in the back, uh, instruments, and all that touring. And that was a fantastic experience. Fantastic. Sad at times to go into wards to try to make these guys happy and not let what they look like 
in amputee wards and uh, on that it was it was horrific but particularly for a 20 year old but i knew how fortunate i was to be one of three war department shows that was great did you ever play the va hospital here which was at the biltmore at that time um it would have been right after the war yeah it wasn't a va hospital here until after right. it was yeah it was, it was the Army hospital yeah, it was a, I went there as a patient. <laughs> the, uh, uh, and thank goodness, they were going to tear down that lovely, lovely building. They were going to tear it down. And, and thank goodness to all those involved who kept it. What a landmark. I mean, when I was doing my flying all over for corporate and even out of the country and stuff to come into the airport and you see the towering uh, uh, hotel, it's magnificent. Anybody else? Uh, just one or two, okay. Um, looking back, let's say, 50 years ago to 1954, comparing it with today, what would you say are the major changes, the things that would shock you most or that are most unexpected? I don't know, it's hard to say. Like people say to me, uh, oh, uh, you know, you've been here a while, you've seen some changes. You see changes in five years. When I came in 38, here and went to high school, junior high and high school, it was a small town. In the 50s, it was exciting because I had the band, you know, and playing the hotels. And very fortunate at that. Not always working, uh, but working, I would say, as much eventually and more. And I was fortunate also to have my wife singing uh, with the band. Uh, it was, it was a great experience. The 50s was the renaissance, really, here of Latin music. And my first band, uh, I was the only uh, uh, gringo in the band. I mean, the guys, uh, two guitars, uh, two guys from Tampa, one who could hardly speak English, okay? Don Peño. That was, people say, oh, you know, this Miami Beach was Latin, Cuba. I know. No, Tampa was Ybor City. That's where the Latins were, you know. So the first band I had was uh, Dos Guitarras, Maraki, Wongo, Cuatro Voce. Two guitars, uh, a maraca player, and myself on bongos, and four voices. And we played behind the bar at the Pan American Hotel in Miami, which has been torn down like a lot of stuff. It was delightful. It was delightful. And my best friends were... Uh, or Cuban, who, who came from Cuba in those days. And uh, my, my one friend, who was young, couldn't speak English, and I wanted to learn Spanish. In those days, that's BC, you know, before computers, before television, <laughs> really. And we used to lay on a beach, and I said, look, un pacto, live. We talk one hour Spanish, one hour English. He learned English, I learned Spanish, we laughed a lot. Got sunburned a lot, but uh, it was it was a glorious time. But it's it's you know like the old cliched expression: had I known it would have been an era, I would have paid more attention. But a young married with two little kids, you're know, struggling to make a living, you know. But um, and never having been to Cuba except on my honeymoon, four days at the Nacional. I really said, oh, I'll go when I have more time. I don't want to go on my day off. I don't want to go and spend some time. Well, and along came Castro, so. Okay, I think, I think that may do what I mean. Yes? Who, who else besides Machito uh, would have been some of your favorite? Uh, favorite bands? Influence, what, what might have influenced your style? The first band I heard, believe it or not, was Xavier Cugat when I was 13, 14. I got hooked because Miguelito Valdez was the singer. And Cougar did more typical stuff. And I heard him singing Bruca Manigua, which I never forgot. It was typical stuff. Little by little, Cougar became more commercial. But then my favorite bands later in years, Machito was fantastic. The big three, you know, Tito Puente was in later years and Tito Rodriguez. Whatever Latin music was happening here, let's face it, the heart of Latin music was still New York City. The Palladium, the bands, competitions, 
you know, the battle of the bands. But, you know, the people came down, mostly Jewish people who had to have their Latin music when they were down here. They had to have their Latin music and Chinese food. So, you know, that's it. Folks, you've been great, and I'd be happy to talk to anybody who wants to linger. So thank you, and thank you for the opportunity.